All right, everyone, I am here with Greg Brockman. Greg is co-founder and CTO at OpenAI. Greg, welcome back to the Twimble AI podcast. Thanks for having me, Sam. Hey, uh, it's been a while since we spoke. It was back in November of 2017, believe it or not. Uh, Episode 74 of the podcast, we're over 500 now, and we were then talking about AGI. I am really looking forward to this chat where we'll be talking about uh, something new that OpenAI has been working on for a while, uh, Codex. Uh, But before we do, uh, why don't you reintroduce yourself to our audience and tell them how you came to work in the field of AI? Hey, everyone. I'm, I'm Greg, as uh, Sam said, and I am one of the co-founders of OpenAI. Um, you know, for me, I've read the Alan Turing 1950 paper, Computing Machinery and Intelligence paper, uh, back before I knew how to code. And I remember reading it. You know, it lays out the Turing test, but then it says, look, you're never going to be able to program a solution to this test. The only way to do it is you have to have a learning machine. And he goes into quite some detail. You know, he says, like, look, you're going to have to do this, like, to have a little machine that's almost like a child machine that you uh, give rewards when it does good things, punishment when it does bad things. And from there, you can hope to build up a solution to this. Really visionary stuff, honestly. And for me, I was captivated by the idea that you could build a machine that could understand problems that you yourself could not. And I I just saw being able to build machines that could themselves uh, help you solve problems that were outside of your reach be the thing I wanted to do. Um, So I went to to a professor and was like, hey, could I do some some, uh, NLP research with you? And he's like, great, yep, here's these like parse trees and things like that. Um, And uh, sadly, it didn't look like that was gonna gonna quite get you there. So I got distracted by programming languages, which you know I think kind of captures the same idea, right? Of like if you can build a compiler, can kind of understand this program, and can really amplify what it, what a, what a human can do. Um, and then you know did startups, and and uh, it was really 2015 that I first encountered deep learning, and for me. I was watching Hacker News every day, and it felt like there was a new deep learning for this, deep learning for that, but I didn't know what deep learning was. And it was actually surprisingly difficult to just Google around and learn what deep learning actually meant. Um, mm-hmm. So I asked some friends about it, and as I started going around, I realized all of my smartest friends from school were now in deep learning. And that, for me, was a real sign of, okay, maybe there's some real substance here. And the deeper I dug, the more it felt to me like the d- old direction that it just didn't feel right the new direction actually did feel right. And to me, you know, looking back at it now, the thing I find most fascinating is that really this neural net direction, it's not a, you know, five, 10 year thing. It's really a 70 year journey to get to where we are. Um, So it's just exciting to be pushing the frontier of what these neural networks can do. And that's basically what we've been doing at OpenAI the whole time. Nice. You you mentioned your interest in programming early on and parse trees and all that kind of stuff. And, um, you know, that's maybe a a connection to what we're going to be talking about today, uh, again, which is Codex. Um, OpenAI recently uh, announced Copilot, uh, which is another project in the same vein. Maybe uh, tell us a little bit about uh, these projects, what they are and how they're related to one another. Yep. So we've been building the Codex model uh, for about a year now. Uh, we, we really started when we saw GPT-3 uh, be released and people's uh, you know most excited reactions were actually using it for programming. And we looked at that and we said, well, we didn't build this model to program at all. What happens if we actually put some effort into it? And so we actually teamed up with GitHub and Microsoft. You know, GitHub, I think, is probably best in the world at uh, you know knowing knowing what uh, developers want and uh, have great a great community. Uh, and obviously, you know that they have they have lots of of, of data as well. Um, and so we worked really closely with them to try to build a, a product that people wanted, right? To really validate that what we were doing wasn't just a cool research project, but was actually useful from day one. So a month ago, we released Copilot together together with GitHub. Um, which is the first product built on top of Codex and that they use the Codex API that is the same API that we, I guess, by the time people watch this podcast, uh, will have released on Tuesday. Yep. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so, you know, talk a little bit about the relationship between Codex and GPT-3. Um, is it an entirely separate model? Are they uh, the same model with different training data, different training pro- processes? Yep. I would think of Codex as a descendant of GPT-3. So spiritually, you do the same kind of task. GPT-3 is take all the text on the internet and just do an autocomplete task. Predict what 
where it is going to come next. Codex is take all the text on the internet and all the public code and do that same process. And we've made lots of improvements all across the board. Really, this has been an effort of a quarter of OpenAI to make it happen. Um, so we have really had to put in efforts um, from everything to, you know, we have uh, architectural improvements, we have training improvements, we have a lot of just like the, the good old fashioned engineering uh, to make these, these models be fast and responsive has been a huge amount of work as well. So it's really been improvements all across the board. So kind of talking about Codex relative to GPT-3, you mentioned take all of the text on the internet and all of the code on the internet. Uh, in in creating something like a Codex, are those given equal weight or uh, is the code somehow you know more relevant for the task that Codex is likely to, to see? Yeah, the short answer is I think we're still figuring out exactly the right way of of doing it ultimately. I mean, I think that, you know, right now I, our, our process um, is, you know, I think you basically end up uh, with, you know, you, you end up seeing much more code more, more recently than the, than, than, uh, than text. Um, but it's still an open question, I think, exactly what you want. And we've kind of found that, that when you actually look at the models in terms of how people want to use them, that part of what makes Codex really shine is the fact that uh, it has all this world knowledge built in. And so you can actually end up with a model that's very, very good at doing just like, you know, sort of very narrowly defined, complete this programming, you know, this, this function or something mm -hmm. um, without actually being very useful to people. So I think that, that finding the right evaluations uh, is actually one real trick to, to make this, this model work. And so, you know, the, what we really focused on uh, is and has, has actually guided us pretty well so far is at the very beginning of the project we wrote down this data set that's now open source uh, called, we call it human eval, uh, which is a list of problems written by humans that are just programming puzzles. And we kind of designed them to be ones that are kind of, they're a little bit of tricky wording and a little bit um, like, uh, you know, just different from what you would find in, you know, some uh, already out there in, in the training corpus. Um, so kind of intentionally chosen to have some, some twists to them and that sort of thing. Um, and what we found is that by pursuing that metric, it is actually our best North Star metric. Like everything else, if you just look at perplexity, you know, basically like how good it is at exactly at predicting next token in, in text, um, that that particular metric breaks down a little bit for us because you kind of want this holistic, not just how certain do you get that there should be a period here, but you really want just given a pretty natural description of what the problem is going to be. Can you solve that problem? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so when you created that, uh, that data set and that that metric, did you was there a closed loop there where the things that uh, the programs that Codex created against that training set had to actually run and produce the desired result? I, under I understand. Yes, yeah, so, so I'm actually, mostly asking you just from the perspective of evaluating the yeah, yeah, yeah. performance yep. of yes. Codex in terms yes. of producing runnable code. Yes, is that, yes, okay, is that great. an aspect of that data set. Hundred percent, hundred percent. So you okay. literally take. You know, you provide the model with, you know, maybe a doc string and maybe a little bit of a function definition. It generates a bunch of code. You literally eval that code. Now, the details of the eval actually, I think, are, are pretty interesting because you just had some code come out from your model. What's it going to do? Is it going to delete all the files on your computer? Like, it's all possible, <laughs> right? And so you really need to have a good sandbox. And so, uh, you know, I think that one thing people miss in this field is, you know, it's all about the big idea, but what people miss is that actually it's about the small ideas, right? It's about getting the engineering really right. And so, yeah, you want to actually train a model to run some arbitrary code and eval it and make sure it's doing the right thing. You need to have a world-class sandbox to make that happen. And so you need to make sure both that the execution is like not able to do anything, you know, tamper with your system, but also that, um, you know, just even little things like resource consumption and being able to crash your system and things like that are held in check. And we actually have found multiple times that the model would generate code that, that kind of broke our current sandbox. Um, so we've, we've upgraded it since then. Interesting, interesting. So I think that is suggesting to folks that play this play around with this via the API that they take care to inspect the results they get before they just run them if they don't have a sandbox environment that they're uh, yeah. I definitely, I definitely recommend that for any code you take from the internet. Um, you know, if you just download some code from even my GitHub, I, I will not take offense if you double check it before <laughs> just running it. Uh, I think it's, it's just an important thing generally. Um, yeah. But 
I would say that this, this like the model doing unpredictable things is really early in training, right? So when, it, when the model isn't very smart, isn't very capable, um, that, that it's, it's sort of less predictable exactly what it'll do. Um, the more capable the model gets, the more it's going to be faithful to your instructions. So, um, you know, I've been, I've been using this model for, for, you know, I spent quite, quite a bit of time playing with it and that I've actually, you know, found that it's, that it's quite reliable in contrast in some ways to GPT-3. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about uh, those distinctions a little bit more in terms of the types of uh, results that it tends to see versus GPT-3 relative to the the prompts that you're giving it? Yeah. See, the thing about GPT-3 is that I always, and I, I really, like, when we get these new models, I really spend a lot of time with them trying to really understand them, trying to, like, just sort of feel like I get the personality of these models, uh, if you'll forgive the term, because these models, you know, they're not one thing, right? They're really this whole distribution of things. But so for GPT-3, I really spent a lot of time trying to teach it. You know, I have this whole chat session where I was a teacher and I was explaining to it how to sort a list of numbers and it would do one example and get it right. And I'd be like, wow, I really taught it the process of sorting. And then I'd give it another example and it would totally go off the rails and do something wrong. And I think that the feeling that I had was GPT-3 didn't really want to listen. Like it really felt like this, this, you know, this, this being that like had a short attention span and would just kind of like do random things sometimes. And I think that that's probably a reflection of the training data in some ways, right? If you're out there on the internet and you read some text saying, okay, now I'm going to sort a list of numbers. I mean, maybe you're in the middle of a fiction story, right? And then like, you know, that, that some aliens arrive or something. And so it's actually reasonable for GPT-3 to make pretty pretty arbitrary predictions when it's not very confident what should come next. Mm -hmm. But by contrast, in code, what I found with Codex is that when it fails, it does half my instruction, but not the full instruction, right? And sometimes, you know, sometimes you can end up with the traditional failure modes of autoregressive models where it fails by repeating a token over and over, if that's the most mm -hmm. certain one. And basically, most of my experiments I have been, I haven't had to futz with, with hyperparameters, and I've really just set temperature equals zero. So it's just always picking the most likely token. Um, and it's worked out way, way better than for any model that I've tried before. And I think it, that a lot of this comes back to the structure of the data, right? That in code, if I have a comment saying, now I'm going to sort some numbers, you're really going to sort numbers next, right? There's really yeah. nothing else that's about to happen. And so it's almost like we have this great data set that we've built up of instruction following. And I think that that idea we found in GPT land was pretty key to getting something that's even more useful to people. And in code, it's almost built in. Yeah, I, I, I'm very curious about this idea of, um, you know, the code is the data set and the, the self-documenting nature of it. When you think about uh, just kind of raw code that you might find in, in GitHub, so, you, you know, there's, documentation that's going to be at a, I would think, a pretty low kind of semantic level, like, you know, this loop is going to do thing X. Yep. Um, you know, I think of something like a, a stack overflow that's talking about the, the code that you might see in a post at a much higher level. And I wonder uh, a little bit about, um, you know, is all of, uh, you know, to what degree is, is, the code that Codex is trained on, you know, GitHub style versus something that ha might have some more like higher level semantic meaning and, you know, just your thoughts on whether that matters and, um, you know, how, uh, how Codex might evolve with different types of data that you train it on. Yep. I think the answer for this stuff is probably got to catch them all. Like, I think we're at a point with these models and I think GPT kind of set the stage for it is that the broader you go, the more mm -hmm. capable you're going to get. Yeah. And the the part of it is that when we when we do a task, it's kind of impossible to predict exactly what skills people want to bring to bear, right? Like that the, you know, it's almost like uh, if you rewind to the uh, before the you know general purpose computers were uh, obviously the right solution, um, which by the way, they're not even obviously the right solution for all problems, but for most problems they are. Um, mm -hmm. There were specialized machines for each individual application. Yeah. And people were always like, well, your general purpose computer is cool and all, great demo but if you really want to do like you know your 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 contact book you need to use this specialized you know ibm whatever um uh, <laughs> you know machine that existed at the time and i think that that basically it just turns out that many tasks require mixing and matching between lots of different things and so it's kind of hard to pre-bake one answer to everything mm -hmm. and so where we've started has been, you know, again, kind of all the text out there and all the public code. But I think that within code, you know, it's not just 
open, you know, it's not just like, you know, Django and, and projects like that. It's also think about all the IPython notebooks that people put on, on GitHub. Right. And that mm-hmm. I, those ones tend to be very much like a tutorial, right? There's lots of, lots and lots of Kaggle yeah. tutorials and things like that, that are out there. And so you get kind of a very different slice of, of intelligence from those. And I think that what we've been looking at, like, I think kind of a big next step really is figuring out what are the best sources? You know, what do you learn from each one? How do you figure out what you want to balance in the, in, in that model? And, and one thing that, that uh, people probably uh, might be surprised to hear is that Codex, um, you know, it can do lots of things in lots of different languages. You know, it's probably pretty good at about a dozen different languages, but we really trained it just for Python. Like we actually were just like, we just want this thing to be as good at Python as we can. And uh, it, all the other stuff kind of fell out uh, as, as almost an accident. So uh, I think that, you know, if you test it, you'll have, it'll be interesting to see, you know, do people find it very useful for the broad range of languages or is, you know, sort of that, that focus on Python, does that shine through? Nice, nice. I can tell you that it does do Hello World and Lisp. Okay, good. There we go. <laughs> Believe me, we did not try to make a good at Lisp. Um, you know, I'm also fascinated by this this idea that we we talked about uh, earlier. You know, the the language, the the natural language plus the code. And there's part of me that would love to like tweak some hyperparameter that lets you weight one versus the other. Yep. Um, any, you know, any thoughts on that? Or I suspect that your answer is going to be uh, similar to the last one, which is kind of the more the merrier, all having all the data, you know, is going to get you better results than trying to over-optimize or. Yeah. Yeah. I think some of the stuff you're, you're, you're hitting on the right frontiers, I think. Right. And, and look, like just to, to zoom out to the big picture, to me, the most fascinating thing, first of all, is that this is all just a neural net, right? Like you, yeah. fast, you, you rewind back to the 40s and, you know, Pitts and McCullough, like that model of the information processing of the brain, like that's the thing we're still doing today. And so, uh, you know, you can actually find this great paper uh, on Wikipedia uh, called like, you know, a, an interpretation of the history of the of the perceptron and that, you know, the story everyone always told about the perceptron was like, hey, in the 60s, these neural net people overhyped everything and you know all the funding went away. And if you actually look at the historical documents, kind of what was going on is there were two competing camps. There were the symbolic systems people and then there were the neural net people. And that the symbolic systems people had a very concerted campaign to try to dry up all the funding for the neural net people. And that they had all these disparaging things to say, like those neural net people, they have no new ideas. They just want to build a bigger computer. Like that's all they want to do. And, you know, here we are, you know, 40 years later, 50 years later, and yeah, we just want bigger computers and more data. And so I think that is actually the most core answer. Like, you know, I think that we all kind of want the great scientific insight of like, you know, to, to figure things out and to figure out the exact theory of, of mixing. Um, and I think actually the funny thing is I think we can make progress on those problems. Um, but the highest, highest order bit is you need to have a big machine with lots of compute and pour in all the data you can. And like, you know, at some point that, that the, the details of that mix start to really matter. But the highest order bit is actually achieving that first thing. Mm-hmm. Does that, um, you know, to what degree does that like cap innovation? If you've already, you know, pulled all the language in the world, all the text in the world into GPT-3 and all the code in the world into Codex, uh, and it's all about, you know, data and size of compute, where do you go to innovate? Yeah, so I think it's a great question. So on the one hand, you can look at what I said as a pretty depressing thing of just like, okay, it's just you know, just a simple matter of, you know, doing this, this large scale engineering, and you need to have your particle accelerator equivalent in order to do it. Um, But actually, if you dig into the sources of progress in recent years, you know, we we published a couple studies on this. And so we have one study that shows the compute ramp is insane, like it's just faster than any exponential that I'm that I'm aware of. But we also have another study showing the algorithmic ramp, showing the efficiencies due to algorithms is also exponential. And, you know, rather than being like, you know, doubling every 3.5 months, it's like, you know, more like, you know, doubling every year, year and a half, you know, something much more like Moore's Law. I forget the exact number. Mm -hmm. Um, But that's still a pretty insane rate of progress. And so I think that the, the, the truth of all of this is that if you have a paradigm that is worthwhile, right, that like making a more capable neural net, clearly a worthwhile thing at this point, you're going to innovate to the max in all dimensions, and yeah, we've had a pretty big compute overhang because people just weren't willing to spend lots of money on computers, and now people are, so they just spend more money to get ahead of Moore's Law. So that's one dimension. 
similar story for data, you know, that there's been lots of data out there, just like it just wasn't really worth people's effort to collect it, or people didn't really know to do it, whatever it is, there's an overhang of just gather all that data. But on the algorithmic front, you know, I think that's been the one that people have been pushing on. And so there isn't as much of an overhang, you know, there's not like low hanging fruit left around that just no one's thought of that just, you know, you show up and you're just like, gold's at my feet. It takes effort. But I think that the, that the fruit is still there. Right, that it's still mm-hmm. the case that we are making this exponential progress there. So I think it's like just because we're making big progress in certain dimensions, um, you know, that's just temporal, right? That like we cannot keep up the rate of improvement from those dimensions. And so, yeah, once you've saturated them, the only thing left is going to be this other dimension. So I think it's really important we as a community don't lose that muscle that we really build it up. Mm-hmm. And now, if I asked you to comment on the that algorithmic dimension. Uh, would it be uh, would it be asking you to speculate into the, the the future, or is there you know a set of kind of you know relatively low hanging fruit that you know things that you know that um, yep. directions that you know that you want to head on the algorithmic side? Yep. Well, I, I want to talk again about just you know first of all my my personal philosophy you know is 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 very much like uh, you know greatness through a thousand small steps um, that I really. You know, I think, and I think that there are some people who are extremely good at the like one big idea to change everything. Um, and I think that you know, like Ilya, what, who's one of my co-founders, is is extremely good at that. And you you look at like, uh, you know, I think he's you know with, with work like Alex Net, I think he's very good at sort of setting the direction. Um, but for me, I tend to think in terms of okay, like what are all the small details we have to get right to make this happen? And if you look at the current models. You know, the funny thing about GPT-3 uh, is that it actually uses the same the tokenizer that Alec Radford, who, who works at OpenAI, uh, wrote kind of like overnight, right before the deadline, uh, you know, three years prior uh, for GPT-1. And like, you know, that thing is not optimal. It's actually become kind of the standard. Lots of people use it. Um, and, you know, people have done a little bit to, to, to you know, play with different tokenizations and, and retrain them, things like that. But fundamentally, uh, I think that, that there's like a big you know, a big shift in some ways and, and kind of a small detail in other ways of just, we should be really doing bite level models, right? We shouldn't be doing this, like, let's like, you know, sort of tokenize things and, uh, and chunk them up in this like way that kind of maps to, you know, it's, it's almost this like hard coding that's in the model that, that probably would do a lot better if it wasn't there. Um, I think a lot of the story of neural nets has been remove the hard coded stuff and add in learning. So I think that's one example of the kind of thing that I would really love to see someone work on uh, and just to see to see great results from and for us to incorporate that um so i think basically little bits of the architecture that are still like yeah we really should be doing this differently <laughs> um i think that, that that for me is is actually where i put a lot of focus I'm, i wanted to kind of transition to you know how we should think about codex as like users and practitioners those folks that want to play with it like how how should we you know, think about interacting with this API to get the most out of it. And yep. you know, let's maybe start with what is it best at versus what, where are the, you know, the soft edges? Yes. Well, I will first say, I think that no one knows yet to the answer of <laughs> what is it best at. Like, <laughs> I can tell you what I've discovered in my efforts, right? And I'll yeah. say for me, I know I'm scratching the surface. Like, I know I am. Fair enough. Um, but and I, that's, that's a wonderful thing, by the way. You know, if you train a vision model on, on ImageNet, you know what it's good at, right? It's very, very good at all the dog breeds. Um, this model, general <laughs> purpose, so it, it's, it's quite good at lots of things. Um, I have, so for, for me, you know, I really latched onto this, uh, being able to provide instructions in natural language and have it generate an executable output, right? So basically talk to your computer, does it. Um, mm-hmm. When, you know, when we first started playing with the model, like, it wasn't clear that it would be good at that. And I just kind of realized, like, hey, this model, when I give it these, like, because I actually started out the other on the other side. I started out with trying to say, if I just want to provide one big instruction and have it write a whole program. And, you know, it was quite reliable at doing things like, I'd say, make it to Kinter UI that, like, has a button that says, hello, world, and then you click it and sends an email. Like, that level of instruction, it could actually write, like, you know, the... 30, 40 lines of Python to do it. And sometimes you make a little mistake. You'd forget to like wire up the button or, you know, it kind of have like a placeholder for whatever. Um, but the way it would fail was again, very interpretable, right? I could look at it and be like, oh, okay, I just kind of forgot this piece. And so yeah. then I started thinking about, well, what I really want is I want to be able to chunk this instruction up into smaller pieces because, you know, it, it did 80% of it. And so if I just had a 50% size instruction, maybe it'll do hundred percent of it. Um, and so I think that that's kind of the highest level picture of where we are is the model. I think it's not yet ready to do big things, 
right mm-hmm. on its own. But it's ready to do small things. And honestly, for programming, like I like doing the big things. I don't like doing the small things myself, right? The uh, the like you know, okay, like here's this very specific fiddly thing, and like get the details of the indexing right, like that kind of thing. The model it knocks it out of the park. Or memorizing the details of you know this whatever framework. Like you know, I used to write in Ruby on Rails, and most Ruby on Rails is just knowing what the Railsism is to do any right. particular thing. Right. Right. And um, yeah, and by the way, I mean, like, I- IDEs are just not very good at Ruby on Rails because there's so much dynamicism and things like that. Um, but this model, I think, would be would be quite good at it. So I think basically figuring out how to work with those strengths is important. And so part of it is, I think, like, one dimension that I think is very exciting is baking it in as an interface to lots of existing applications. So we have a example of baking to Microsoft Word. But I think that for any website, really, you should now be able to very easily build an interface where you just say like, you know, you know, what if you're depending on what your web app is, you know, go and look up the, uh, you know, go send an email to this person or, uh, you know, like, yeah, any of the functionality that's in your website should become voice controllable or you know, natural language controllable without having to necessarily click through a bunch of buttons in order to get there. You mentioned that some of your initial observations were that you, you construct this prompt and, it will spit out results that, you know, were 80% there or missing some detail or something like that. Um, and that you solve that by kind of chunking your prompts and making them smaller and more, uh, more compact. Do you think the, the issue that you experienced originally was, um, you know, uh, was on the input side or the the output side, if that makes sense, was it a, a you know an issue in the a fault in kind of the generation process right. where it you know couldn't pull the the, the piece for that um, you know couldn't make the connection necessary required for that last twenty percent or was it yep. you know forgot it in the parsing stage using really yeah. rough language here to, yep. to yeah yeah to yeah you're asking you're asking the great mysteries of of the what's going on inside the neural net um, <laughs> which I, I you know I, I think is 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 always very interesting and. And, you know, for, for me, well, first of all, I also think that if you ask literally me to do the same task without access to an interpreter, so I just have to write the program once without ever being able to push backspace, I'm not going to do a good job either. Like, trust me, like I will not. Most of programming for me is I write a little bit and I run it and it doesn't work and sure. I change it and I fix it and I iterate and I fix it, you know, and that, that other piece this model doesn't get to do it at all. So I think that it's very possible that the model simply cannot, like, you know, just reading all that text and really deeply thinking through all the details of how the interface should work is a bottleneck. Um, and then secondly, it's very possible that just, like, it just, as it's writing, it just realizes, oh, no, I really wish that I'd, like, implemented this function beforehand. So you know what? I'll just pretend that it's implemented later and, like, you know, then never gets to it. So I don't know which of those stories is more true. My guess is that it's a mix of both. Um, and partly I just look at myself like, you know, look, this is not a human like intelligence. So it may be too, you know, uh, a little bit too egocentric to think that I can look to what I'm good at and bad at to map to where the model makes mistakes. Mm-hmm. But I will say that for me, it's been actually like, I feel much more in tune with the failures and successes of Codex than I did with GPT-3. For me, it does feel like when it fails, I'm a little bit like, you know, and sometimes sometimes the way it fails, by the way, is it'll just put in pass, you know? So it's like, you know, I have a nice Python, you know, def, whatever, and like I put in a doc string. I'm like, okay, model, you go now. And its solution is just to put in pass or, you know, comment to do, um, <laughs> something like that. <laughs> And I get it. It's a little bit like it's like okay, I'm not going to be able to do this, so I'm not even going to try, right? And you know, I'm not, I don't, I don't think that's necessarily uh, uh, the you know the only characterization, but it really feels like you know if you if you think of how code is usually structured, that I think that that uh, it actually starts to feel a little bit more like constrained in terms of the the again, you know, you have this pattern of comment complete or total out, um, and kind of nothing in between. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you, you just mentioned uh, the structure that code tends to have. Um, the you know codex operates like GPT GPT three in this kind of input you know process output paradigm. Have you done any playing around or experimentation to try to um, force fit structure into that input in a way that it understands that it can produce more you know structure on the output? Well, so I, I have one 
so I have I have a couple of, of different dimensions that I think are very interesting, right? So um, look, there's there's one dimension that I think is is kind of fun, which is translating between languages. And so I have I have a little demo of a um, writing writing a, a Python program. So I wrote a Python program that then you run it, make some calls to the API, generate some Ruby code, and that Ruby code is just a program that calls the API to generate some Python code, and you get this Python Ruby oscillator forever and ever. It's a little bit like writing a Quine. It's just like kind of kind of a fun fun little thing. Um, I actually tried doing the same thing for Python to Ruby to JavaScript to Python to Ruby to JavaScript. I got it to do like six cycles of Python Ruby JavaScript um, mm-hmm. before it, before it broke. Um, so it actually was like each time writing a little bit of unique code, uh, which is which is kind of a cool thing to see. Um, so yeah. setting it up for that, I think was was a very interesting challenge because there you really have to make sure that your your prompt, which is kind of contained within the program, uh, is something that kind of like gives the enough context to the API for it to actually generate the whole new program. But, you know, it's like, you really got to play some, some, some nice uh, fiddly games to make it happen. So, you know, that I think is more of a proof of concept. It's more of like a, like a interesting exercise than it is something very practical. Um, but there's actually another direction that I was experimenting with that I, I, I think it's like interesting and very fruitful if someone can make it work of, you know, look, programming is two things. It's, understand the super hard problem and decompose it, right? So it's basically problem decomposition and then mapping the small problem to code. We've already said Codex is really good at that second thing, probably better than I am. Mm-hmm. That first one, is it actually bad at it? And all I know is that the obvious ways of making it good at it, I haven't succeeded at, but I, but using Codex for task decomposition is something I've tried a little bit and got some interesting results on. And, you know, you can do things like you have Codex call into, you know, you basically tell it, oh, there's this like magical Oracle function. And so Oracle is you give it some natural language and then just like the machine will magically implement it for you. And then you say, okay, do this hard task and you get access to call the Oracle thing. And then you can see, can Codex generate good calls, sub calls to Oracle? And I've actually gotten it to as a little bit of like a, you know, together working with Codex to be able to get it to do things like, you know, go on Google and like download an image of, you know, a particular person and put it into a website and things like that. And, you know, you use Selenium to, 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 uh, to orchestrate all of this. Um, and I think that ideas like this are, are are very interesting because maybe you can actually have Codex as a tool that helps in more of the cognitive domain in addition to this like very mechanical like code emission domain. Mm-hmm. Is there a um, you know input pattern that you've seen or a hyperparameter that can kind of guide it towards a degree of complexity in the solution? Like there's a the length of the output, you know. Uh, as a, uh, as a uh, you know, one idea that might be that, you know, hey, if I say, you know, give me hello world and I want it to be, you know, 300 characters in length or a thousand characters in length, that's going to be you uh-huh. know, one thing. If I say, yep. you know, 10,000, like, is it going to give me the, you know, J2EE enterprise <laughs> right, style right, right, hello right. world? Yep. Yep. I mean, I think the best the, the best starting point, by the way, for all these things, the, the only real answer is you got to try it, right? Like you really just need to play with it. Um, but I think the place to start is just by asking the model for what you want. And if the model doesn't quite seem to get it, you try to spell it out more clearly, expand how you're asking, like really think about if this were a junior programmer and I had to really hold their hand and walk them through it, how would I do it, right? And sometimes that's break it up into multiple instructions. Sometimes that's just expand more of what you're asking for. So I think that's definitely the starting point. Another very powerful thing is providing more examples, right? So one thing we really haven't done very much of yet is trying to do GPT-3 style prompt engineering and trying to provide Mm -hmm. prompts to the model that really show examples of the behavior you want. And like all the indications so far and all the times that we've tried is that it's quite good at that. Um, but we just haven't really pushed it in the way that we push GPT-3, in part because it's already capable at the tasks we want simply by asking. So, you know, like we just kind of didn't have to go down that road. And then the third thing, of course, is fine-tuning. And so we have a GPT-3 fine-tuning API these days. Um, you know, we'll be rolling that out for Codex. Um, and, you know, like I think that that will open a new dimension to what you're able to make it do. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Uh, one of the interesting examples I saw in um, some of the materials was a, you know, not your traditional kind of create a program like, you know, X, Y, Z, but it was just solve this word problem, like, you know, from a 
elementary school, you know, Jason has six apples and Emily yep. four apples, uh, something like that. Um, but it, it created a program to figure out this word problem. Yes. Right. Yep. Uh, I thought that was really interesting and it made me immediately think about, uh, the implications of something like this in education, you know, both coding education, but, you know, more broadly in education. Any thoughts on that? Yeah. So the funny thing is when we were starting OpenAI, I, you know, I'd, I'd left my previous job and I knew I wanted to start a company and I had three possible domains on my list. Number one was AI, which turned out to pan out. Um, <laughs> number two was VR slash AR. And I kind of scratched that off very quickly. But number three was programming education. You know, this is an area that's very near and dear to my heart. I feel like, you know, for my programming education, it was, you know, I started out very self-taught, just building stuff that I was excited about. And it was just hard. You know, it's just not very much fun to like, you know, it's like, look, you do W3 schools tutorial back in the day. I'm sure there are better tutorials now. But then you're just stuck staring at an editor and thinking about what do I build, right? And you run your thing and it doesn't work. And what do you do, right? And you don't know about a lot of concepts. You know, I didn't know about serialization. And so I was building, actually, I built one of the first things I built was a chatbot game. So it was that you had a little chatbot that you could train by talking to it. And uh, then you could have a little chatbot battle where you would like play this game where uh, one window that you were talking to was a chatbot, one was a person, and uh, you had to distinguish which, 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 which was which before your opponent would. Um, and all this stuff, you know, I didn't, I didn't know what serialization was. So I just like had this, like, I came up with a magical identifier that or you know, like a string of characters that I thought no one else would, would ever type. And I used that <laughs> as my record separator. Um, and just looking back, I just wish that someone was there to say, oh, you should probably use JSON here. And then I'd be like, what's JSON, right? I'd go around, I'd figure out how to use JSON. And I would have just sort of cut off this whole tree. You know, there's a little bit of the tree that was very useful for me to figure out why is it useful to have serialization? Like, mm -hmm. you know, why don't you just want to do your own record separator? You know, what are the problems? But there's a bigger tree of really implementing it and building out the library and trying to make it work and like that kind of thing that was a little bit of wasted effort. And so what I am excited to see with Codex is that we have a model that for the first time you can show it code and can, can actually kind of understand it. And so we've done a little bit of playing around with code explaining, right? And it actually can do a decent job of, of you taking a function and explains how it works or can generate comments for it or generate doc strings, generate um, unit tests. And I think that all those things really open up the possibility of having a personalized programming tutor, right? And that to me is just like, it's amazing. Like I would love to be able to see yeah programming education fall out from, you know, pursuing the AI passion. Uh, and uh, we will get there. It's just a question of, you know, I'm hopeful that Codex is enough, um, at least to take the first steps. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, does there need to be an element of, uh, I guess I made a mental connection to like explainability in these kinds of models and, you know, a tutor, you want your tutor to be able to explain to you um, the connections beyond just you know showing you an example which is kind of what codex does now it does that uh kind of call to mind the whole explainability uh around these kinds of models to you and and do you think that's a, a piece that would be interesting in that context yeah so i think maybe in a non-traditional way like i think that the traditional explainability has been we want to look at the connections of the neural net and explain mm -hmm. why it made a decision that it made yeah right but I mean, if you think about the equivalent problem for humans, we're not very good at it either, right? You know, we don't sure. open up the neurons of the brain and be like, oh, wow, look at look at the connection between these two neurons, right? You ask someone, why did you make that decision? And I think most of behavioral science is basically realizing that our own explanations of our actions are quite poor, right? That like, you know, you you kind of do something and you come up with some like back narrative yeah. for why you did it. Yeah. Um, so I kind of feel like the baseline we should shoot for is that we should shoot, you know, look, we should get to a better place than where we are with humans in terms of being able to explain why decisions were made. But at the very least, I think it's a good baseline to hit. And so I think that what we should be trying to focus on with these models is that, you know, they write some, you know, they're given a function and that they should explain how it works. If they wrote their own function, they explain why they wrote it. And that explanation actually adds up. You know, and like maybe it turns out that in fact, just like the human version, that it doesn't quite correspond to, you know, sort of objective truth in some ways. And that it says, well, I made this decision because of this variable and that variable, and they change that variable and it still does the same thing. Um, you know, that kind of experiment I think would be very interesting to see. But on the other hand, I think that 
for these super complicated tasks. And let's not kid ourselves. I mean, like even writing the simplest program is a super complicated task of like, you just got to understand so many different concepts. You need to know this whole library of all these different functions. Like that is really hard. And I think that to even fit in our brain exactly the like, okay, like, you know, how do I translate? How would I even write a program for, you know, say, you know, say it five times, you know, like something like that. Mm -hmm. Um, what, what is it supposed to reference? Like, you know, five, like how is that represented? Like all the different ways you could see it. Um, I think that for us to write a program that can do that is just going to be such a giant complex tree that even a trace through it would be extremely complicated and probably, you know, something that's outside of humans, humanity's ability to understand. So I think the trick is number one, uh, having the, you know, just focusing these models on being able to provide good explanations that that feel right at an intuitive level to mm -hmm. outputs that feel like they were written by a person. And I think that that we're on trajectory for, you know, I think that you can ask Codex for this stuff today and maybe it'll do a good job. You know, maybe it's not exactly what it was trained for. So maybe it won't, but I think that, that you can, you can at least get started. Um, but I think there's a next step, and this is actually part of our alignment work at OpenAI is thinking about models that themselves are really optimized for explaining what another model did, right? Because here we have these, you know, we have this super complicated problem uh, that this model like, came up with a solution for and that it did it in a super complicated way that we can't understand. But hey, we know how to train models that can do super complicated things that we don't understand. And so maybe you can get an explainer model to do it. And mm -hmm. I think that, that really finding the right balance here where you can have a very trustworthy model and, you know, that there's, there's ideas that we have for how to actually do it. Um, but maybe you can bootstrap your way to models that can actually solve problems where we don't even understand the solution, but then they explain and they have to really prove to these other models that what they're doing is legit. Um, and I think that, that this kind of thing is, is in our, our, uh, our you know, might, might take a while to get there, but that is in our future. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, some of the, the broader societal issues that, um, you know, something like a codex, codex gives rise to are questions like uh, jobs, uh, copyright, and, you know, potentially fairness bias. Um, can we maybe dig into those really quick uh, thoughts on kind of job implications? Yeah. So I, I think that the interesting thing about codex in particular, as an example of AI in general, is that it's just not playing out how people expected, right? I think that the expectation was that AI is going to take this job and then that job and then this job. And the only question is just ordering the jobs in, in order of automation. But in reality, I think AI is kind of taking no jobs and it's taking a percentage of all jobs at once. And that percentage tends to be the kind of boring drudge work stuff. Um, and I think that's actually a pretty inspiring picture, right? You look at it in the case of Codex, that programming, you know, being a software engineer requires you to talk to users, understand what users want, come up with an idea of the thing that they are going to be excited to use and have this picture of like how you're going to build it. So there's the architecture of the system. When it comes to implementing, you want to design in a way that will be future compatible. So, you know, tomorrow users are going to ask you for something else and you should make it so you should make it so it's really easy to build that feature, right? So you kind of have to anticipate all the different ways that you might want to modify your system. None of that is... And then you also want to write, you know, you want to implement using a right. framework and, you know, know that exactly after all API that, it's API docs and stack overflow. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. And so we actually have very poor tools for those, those, that last piece, but that's not what we want to spend our time on. And mm -hmm. so I think what we're going to see with Codex, and I think that this, again, I think is representative of the kind of AI we're building is we're going to find that the kind of like, the heart, you know, the drudge work, the part that is like you need to know the whole encyclopedia of your field that, you know, just like even coming with an idea of where to start, like those problems that I think are real barriers to people getting started, those are going to start really melting away. And then that will free up people to actually work on the exciting stuff. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. copyright is the, the next one. I know that, you know, the big issue here is that there are no answers and the system hasn't quite figured it out yet. Um, but I'm wondering what your quick take is on that. Yep. So, uh, you know, I think that, you know, our position is definitely that, you know, training, training on, you know, publicly available code and, and text is fair use. Um, but I think that it's definitely the case that the technology here is running ahead of the law, right? I think that, you know, that's something that I think is, 
has, has happened many times in the past. And so I think that it's time for a public conversation about this. Like part of the reason that we're doing a preview here, you know, that this is, this is a API that will be available starting to roll out now is that we want that feedback. We want to start that conversation. And, you know, technologies like Codex, you know, I think they have a lot of potential. I think we would, you know, be doing a disservice to ourselves if, they weren't easy to build. Um, that were, lots of people weren't able to use them. So I'm very hopeful that that we can figure out how do we get the good of these systems and get lots of benefits, and you know just really help help it help it super supercharge the economy in a way that, that we think is you know doing doing the right thing for everyone. Mm-hmm. And are there fairness bias types of issues that have come up for you in the the context of Codex? For sure. Yeah, I think that fairness and bias are, are like kind of a key part of AI. And I think that, you know, one thing that, you know, first of all, I think that, that those issues themselves, I think, you know, deserve a lot of space because, you know, we're building these systems that, you know, that they are being trained on data that is generated by all of us, right? And that if you're, if you're, you know, sort of not careful, you're going to latch onto the wrong things or help amplify biases that exist in the system. So I think that this is always going to be an important thing and the stakes are just going to raise as, as we go. Um, but I also want to point out that I think that Codex also represents a bit of a raising of the stakes of the kinds of fallout that you can get from, from a misbehaving system, right? You know, that if you generate some code with Codex and it does decide to delete all your files, um, that's probably not something you want, right? So I think that, that we need to figure out what values go into these systems uh, and that, you know, we, we have uh, uh, some preliminary work on this that, that uh, I think we've, we've uh, you know, published, published a bit on already. Um, but I think you also need to think about how do you really align these, how do you technically align these systems with whatever value should be in there? And I think that, you know, look, like we've got some technical problems ahead of us, but I think the question of, you know, both who are the people who are actually building it and making sure that that, uh, that that is diverse and representative enough, I think is pretty pretty critical. Um, but also the question of, you know, how exactly are those values chosen? You know, who makes that decision? Uh, I think one day that's going to be kind of the most important problem that we as a community and, you know, we as a society are facing. And so I think that, you know, it's never too soon to, to start really, really working hard on these problems. Mm-hmm. A uh, related issue is uh, access and accessibility, and that's maybe a segue to kind of the rollout plan for Codex. Can you yes. Talk a little bit about that? Yes. So we really want this technology to be out there and used. We think it can deliver lo- a lot of value, and we think that it's like a little taste of a future to come. So uh, that's really important to us. We're going to do the same kind of playbook we did with GPT-3, where we're going to have a private beta. We're going to roll it out as quickly as we can safely. We're going to be scaling it up. Um, the, the invites will start flowing on on Tuesday. Um, so again, when everyone sees this podcast, uh, the, the, the first invites will all be out. And you know, honestly, we, we just want to learn, right, that we have a new technology here. And the best way to understand how it will impact the world is by actually seeing it impact the world. And our philosophy is very much try to get you know a, a broad slice of usage at smaller scale and scale it up as you go. Um, and there's very particular things that we did for GPT-3. You know, we have an academic access program in order to make sure that, that, that you know, the academics are able to get uh, to get access. I think that, you know, for this, I think that there's going to be different segments that are going to be excited about using it. You know, I think that people who are programming, you know, students, I think are like one segment who uh, we want to make sure that, that this is accessible to. So we really want feedback. We really want to see how people are excited about using our technology. And we are very excited about you using it. And honestly, we need need your help to understand it. Awesome. Awesome. And is there a, was there something about a competition that you're hosting for this? Yes. Um, so Thursday, 10 a.m. Uh, so I don't know what time you're planning on releasing the podcast, but Thursday, 10 a.m., we are going to have a new kind of programming competition. So you will be able to use Codex as both your teammate and a competitor. So everyone's going to get access to some number of queries to Codex while doing Python programming challenges. And uh, it should be very exciting. There will be a leaderboard for, for the whole internet uh, racing to solve these challenges. But really the goal is to get a sense of what is it like to work alongside Codex. And this is one way we can really accelerate access to everyone and give them, give them a chance uh, to, to get a little taste of it. Awesome. Well, of course, we'll have pointers in the show notes for this episode. Uh, But Greg, thanks so much for taking the time to uh, give us what is effectively a a preview, a a sneak peek, uh, although it will be released uh, by the time this show is public. Uh, Great to have you on the show once again. Yep. Great to be back. Thank you so much.